My name is Jason Higgins and I'm an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. I am in Stillwater with Mr. Bob Hendrickson to discuss his time during and after serving in the United States military. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Hendrickson. You're welcome. Um, let's begin with when and where you were born. Well, I was born um, in Hayes, Kansas, and uh, lived out in the country, 15 miles, okay. in the buffalo grass country on, on a ranch, okay. and uh, <clears throat> went to school at Hayes. Okay. And who were your parents, and what did they do? Uh, my father was uh, Jake Henriksen, and he was a farmer, rancher. He had um, 3,600 acres of uh, ranch land, buffalo grass country, and raised uh, cattle and all kinds of uh, uh, farm crops, wheat, barley, and things to feed the cattle. And do you know much about the history of your family, how they got to Kansas? My grandfather was um, from Norway. And he came over on the white uh, ship line, and they settled in in Hayes, and um, he died of pneumonia at the age of 32. Yeah. So uh, grandmother and uh, the three children uh, lived at Hayes and uh, continued to live on the um, small farm. 80 acres, until uh, Dad was able to um, take care of his mother hmm. and uh, moved out to a ranching uh, farm north of Hayes. Okay. And do you know how your parents met? Uh, yes. Um, my mother was working for a neighbor as um, a home helper. and. Um, they got together because they were living close together, they're near Hayes, and um, uh, they got acquainted, got married. Okay. <laughs> and uh, do you have a family uh, history of military service? Yeah, well, I have, um, <clears throat> I'm from third in the family of nine, and my uh, um, oldest brother uh, was not um, uh, drafted into the service. Hmm. My other brother, and that's older than myself, Lester, uh, was in the service in the Air, Air um, Corps. Hmm. And uh, my little brother, younger than myself, was um, in the military and served in uh, uh, Europe, Germany, I see. in that area. So tell me a little bit about what it was like being one of nine growing up during the Great Depression. Well, it was um, a challenge for uh, my parents because they were 15 miles out in the country, one, one thing. The other was that um, food was available because they had chickens and cattle and, and hogs. Hmm. But in order to feed the family of nine, uh, Dad uh, made arrangements with the grocery store in Hayes to come out and slaughter one of the animals out in the range and take water from the river hmm. <laughs> and uh, wash the carcass, take it back to town and that provided groceries for the family. Um, heat was a problem. We lived in a small um, uh, house and it was uh, uh, always a problem with heating. When dad had enough money to buy coal, he bought coal. When there wasn't adequate enough, uh, the whole family would go out and pick up cow chips. 
and that was often used for fuel for to warm the house. Hmm. So it was uh, always, we always had food, but um, sometimes it was necessary to do, um, and because there was no wood available in that area, hmm. but there was available the cow chips and uh, coal when it was, um, when there was enough money to buy it. I see. Yep. And uh, did the community have gatherings or of any kind? Always had a dance on Saturday night in somebody's big barn. <laughs> <laughs> and the wife and I would uh, always go dancing. And um, the um, f community would get together. Uh, so yes, there was always gatherings. Hmm. Um, some at the uh, country school, uh, which was uh, three miles from our home, and uh, we walked to walked to school always, walked back, always tried to get home in time to do the chores. <laughs> Did you Every carry child your lunch? had something to do. <laughs> I see. Did you carry your lunch with you to school? We always carried a lunch to school, and that often consisted of uh, a sandwich and an um, uh, orange or an apple of some kind. Uh, some of the neighbors uh, had facilities where they could go fishing, and they would bring a catfish and eat it cold. Hmm. Well, it was new to me, so I would trade my apple for a catfish. <laughs> Something different. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it a, a one-room schoolhouse? Can you talk a little no, bit it, about that? It was actually a three-room schoolhouse. The uh, <clears throat> first four grades in one side and the next four in the other side. And the third room was supposed to be for high school. But uh, there was not always a teacher available and there was not always students available. They would go through to the eighth grade, but uh, in most cases they go back to help the parents. Mm -hmm. And I was the one that got to go to Hayes to high school to uh, finish my, my undergraduate degree. What allowed you to remain in school during that time? Uh, my interest in education, okay. my interest in knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, when I finished high school, I asked my dad if I could go to college. And he says, yes, come on, get in the car. He took me into Hayes. He was already aware of the uh, dean at the Fort Hayes State College. He was also um, knowledgeable of the uh, experiment station at Hayes. Hmm. So he knew uh, who to make contact with. And was he a college educated man? No, he was not. He was a high school educated. Okay. But he was uh, interested in and always improving his uh, uh, farm ranch. I see. And uh, he worked with the experiment station on various uh, crops hmm. that he was raising and animals too. I see. And uh, you mentioned a wife. Um, when did you meet your wife? Well, at that time, jackrabbits were a, a big problem in the state. Hmm. And they were eating the crops so that uh, so, so abundant that uh, they had uh, jackrabbit hunts. Hmm. Um, sometimes um, uh, every month, sometimes every other week. And so <clears throat> her parents, uh, I was allowed by my father to drive the truck to put the rabbits in. Mm. And the neighbors got together with uh, clubs and things to make noise and would uh, <clears throat> scare the, the rabbits up into a smaller group where they could hit them over the head. <laughs> and the state was paying for the ears. So she was with her parents at the rabbit hunt and I was driving the truck 
and she arranged to come over and ride in the truck with me. <laughs> so we got acquainted. I see. Yeah. How old were you? Gee whiz, I, I suspect I was, uh, when I first met her, I was 16. Okay. Yeah. So she didn't go to school with you? No. Okay. She went to Ellis, uh, which was uh, west of Hayes. She mm -hmm. went to their school there. And uh, I went to school uh, after leaving the, the community school. Mm -hmm. I went to Hayes, and so when she finished school, and I finished school, we uh, then arranged to get together a little more frequent, mm -hmm. going to picture shows. Oh, let's see. Any favorite movies? Oh, gee, I don't remember, but <clears throat> always uh, cowboy. Shows were the the most important thing. I see. <laughs> and uh, whenever, so you were married whenever you went to college, then. Uh, I I did. Uh, uh, well, I married in 40, 1942, Oh. Just uh, before I volunteered, so then I got to stay <clears throat> uh, home for six months until they then arranged for me to go into service and yet so I was I was married but uh, for a short period. So your your school was interrupted by World War II? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there was no deferments during that time for students? No. Okay. So uh, do you recall uh, December 7th 1941? Do you remember yeah. what your impressions were, what you were doing? Can you talk a bit about that? Well um, it, it's not a vivid memory for me, mm -hmm. but uh, we were at a uh, Saturday night dance at Hayes when we first heard the, the uh, come over the radio that the uh, Japanese were uh, bombing uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. Hawaiian Isles. And at that point, did you realize that you would be called to war? I anticipated that I would be. Right. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, the draft was on at that time. Uh -huh. So everybody that turned 18 was uh, drafted okay. sometime during that short period. Okay. And um, what service did you volunteer for? Well, I just volunteered to join the military. Okay. And uh, when, uh, when I finally was asked to come in, uh, they uh, sent me down to Fort Leonardwood. And I took my basic training in Fort Leonardwood in infantry. Right. And um, completing the basic uh, training, uh, they realized that I was a farm boy and could drive a tractor, therefore I was eligible for the um, tank division, the armored division. I see. So they sent me to Fort Belvoir School to be able to uh, drive a tank. <clears throat> and uh, from there I was uh, moved to uh, commanding the tank. and. You had to stand up in the tank and and uh, <clears throat> command the, the group. Mm. And so I decided that I didn't want to die in a tank. Mm. And the uh, uh, was the opportunity then to uh, apply for uh, the Air Force. And since my brother was in the Air Force, flying B-24s, I thought, well, I'd like to be in the Air Force. Hmm. So I uh, applied, and during all that time with the uh, tank division, I uh, was able to take uh, courses in um, automotive maintenance, hmm. and then they allowed me to take course in heavy engineering equipment maintenance. Hmm. Which, which then qualified me for uh, anything related to repairing military equipment. I see. Well, 
I finished that and uh, became a, a second lieutenant and, and uh, volunteered to uh, go to the Air Force. So arrived at the Air Force and they asked me to take basic training in, for Air Force. Okay. <laughs> so I had infantry basic, uh, uh, armored basic, and Air Force basic. What were some of the similarities and differences between those branches? Uh, they were all very similar, um, except that you, you were learning the specialties in, in each area. Mm. And so when I got to Air Force, uh, I took the basic uh, education mm. in order to be able to fly a plane. I see. So that was, that's different from uh, either infantry or the tank division. Gotcha. So uh, they sent me off to college to uh, uh, learn about uh, flight, flying. And of course all of the information there was different from what I'd had because you know, when you were learning to build bridges in, <laughs> in one area, now you're learning to uh, fly a plane Blow up bridges. Up and, yeah. <laughs> so I got off to uh, um, Air Force training and went to uh, Vincennes, Indiana, where they had a, uh, a flight school, hmm. flight training. Well, when I arrived, uh, I got started to learn uh, flight, air, flying an airplane. And General Arnold, who was in charge of the uh, Air Force at that time, mm -hmm. says, I don't need any more pilots. So um, they gave us, who were there starting our training, an opportunity to uh, either go to the Corps of Engineers or to uh, take parachute uh, infantry. Mm. Well, I chose engineering and uh, combat engineering and uh, <clears throat> so they sent me to uh, engineering school and uh, with my background training of uh, maintenance that I ended up in uh, command of a, a um, um, combat engineering uh, equipment company and we uh, were then sent to the uh, Philippines, landed in Manila, and uh, for a short time we were there until they sent us over to Leyte. Right. And in, uh, at Leyte we uh, used our heavy engineering equipment to build airstrips, and uh, we then we were sent to um, Japan uh, at the town of Tokorozawa. So by the time you had finished all of your training, this was 44 with the, whenever MacArthur took back the Philippines. Yeah. Okay. Do you recall any uh, memorable experiences throughout your training? Uh, what did you guys do during the day? To well, we were involved in uh, uh, leveling the field so that we could put down uh, metal strippings for the airplanes to to uh, fly in. Now, this is coral that you're laying the metal over. Or? Yes. Okay. Well, it was it was just uh, smoothing the ground out, and uh, so we used our equipment to do that so that they uh, they could fly in and uh, land on something more level, let's say. Right, right. And, and while I was in the, in the uh, armored division and uh, engineering school, or not engineering training, we built bridges and we built uh, roads and stuff like that. Back home in the States? Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. Oh. No, this was uh, both in the States and, and uh, in the Philippines. Okay. And um, did you 
make friendships while you were training to go to war? Did what? Did you make many friends? Well, um, in the uh, Japan, made quite a few friends mm. because it, it was a little bit more relaxed mm -hmm. uh, then because it was about the time that they were um, um, signing the peace treaty. Right. So we got to uh, relax and play golf. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about Manila and La Lady. Did you um, interact with civilians during that time? It was uh, particularly in um, uh, Manila. Okay. It was uh, saddening to see the damage that was there. And the Japanese women would be out in the uh, coal beds and uh, the, the damaged uh, parts of, of Manila to find sufficient um, coals in order to prepare a meal for their family. Mm. Uh, that was one of the most memorable things. Because the the town was destroyed so badly that um, it's just one of those things that they survived by finding sufficient uh, heat in order to cook a meal. Right. Mm -hmm. And were there uh, many orphans around during that time? I was not uh, in the position to see that. Okay. I guess. Uh, sure there must have been, but I didn't, I didn't see it. Absolutely. And um, can you can you take us through a typical day and what you did in Manila? We, we were uh, mostly um, building roads and airstrips and maintaining our equipment. Uh, Japanese at the time we arrived, uh, in that early time of Japanese, uh, had dirigibles. And uh, we, when we arrived in Tokorozawa, we took over one of their huge um, dirigible maintenance buildings. And I assume they stored the dirigibles in it. Uh, I just don't know that. But that became our headquarters. Okay. And uh, we worked out of there to maintain our equipment and go from there to build strips. Oh, I see. strips. Okay. And uh, did, during the earlier part, before the surrender, did you encounter any enemy resistance yourself personally? No. No snipers or anything? No. Okay. Only my memorable thing was that I had a new pair of boots, <laughs> and we went to uh, a um, place where the the water was coming up out of the ground. It was warm. <laughs> went swimming one one weekend, and when I got out of the the water to leave to go back, my boots were gone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that that was an American that took your boots? Or? I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't have my new pair of boots anyway. I <laughs> see. So that was like a hot spring you were swimming Yes, in? that's what it was. Okay. Mm. Awesome. Um, so what did uh, you and your fellow soldiers do during your downtime? Well, of course, the uh, PX and the commissary and the officers club was always an uh, assembling point. Mm. Um, during my time in the service, I did not uh, drink, and we were given an opportunity to have uh, liquor. So I would sell my liquor either to the other service guys or um, whoever I could find to sell it to. Mm. Sent the money home so that uh, Alberta could I was able to buy a car when I came home. Hmm. Um, and of course the Air Force people, since we were servicing them, 
they would fly to uh, Canada, pick up Canadian misc, mist, I don't know whether you're mm -hmm. acquainted with that, right. and bring it back. And that was the favorite uh, alcohol right. <laughs> outside of the outside of the officers club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So how did you and your wife uh, communicate during that time? That was strictly by uh, uh, letters. Uh, that's the only way that we had a chance we had to communicate. And how often would these letters come and go? Oh, gee, I would try to write one every other day, a oh, okay. uh, letter. And uh, send uh, money home. And she, during that time, she uh, learned to play the piano. Hmm. So she went to school to, to uh, learn how to play That's and cool. was able to play the piano when I came home. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how she spent her time. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, do you recall, um, what was your impressions after the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Well, I wasn't uh, fully aware of how damaging that, that was hmm. until uh, after I came home and heard more about it. Okay. When I knew that uh, they flew the airplane in and uh, Something gay was the name of the airplane. Then Nola Gay. Nola Gay. And <clears throat> that they dropped the bomb and heard that it destroyed uh, the city, but not to the extent that I learned later. Hmm. Yeah. Now, were these B-29s that were flying from the strips where you were working? Uh, these were B B-24s. B-24s, yeah, okay. mostly. I see. So uh, the we, Liberator, what your what your brother flew in Europe. That's well. right. That's oh. what he flew, and he he flew oh, most of them uh, in Europe, and he was shot down one time, and was recovered, and uh, uh, with all the missions that he flew. I see. So um, after you went from Manila, you went to Leyte. Leyte. What was your impressions of Leyte compared to Manila? It was much calmer and less damaged. Hmm. And uh, we were um, in an area where we had to uh, live in pup tents. Hmm. It rained a lot. Uh, we would turn our boots upside, on, upside down on a stake outside the uh, two-member tank and sometimes one person. And I mean, uh, tent, one person tent, and sometimes two person tent, but uh, that was, then our mission there was uh, strictly uh, uh, building roads and airstrips. Okay. And um, Leyte, there, there was a, that, that was a large population there, right? But Not a, we didn't interact with very many. Okay. Uh, I did buy a Kamona. <laughs> I did uh, uh, send home a um, samurai, samurai sword and a, a dress sword. Okay. So I uh, was able to, uh, I've forgotten what I traded for them, but I traded something to get those items. From another serviceman? And, well, I don't remember where I got them. I got them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they had to come from the Japanese people somewhere. Right. Okay. Lots yeah. of bananas. Um, nothing uh, serious combat. Uh, we were <clears throat> we were strictly um, involved in building roads and airstrips. What did you eat during that time? What did we eat? Yeah. Well, um, of course, there was always um, rations. But um, uh, I was very fond of uh, the um, 
Oh, what's this little stuff that came in a can? Spam? No, the fish. The fish. Uh, sardines? Sardines. Sardines. <laughs> that was different. Uh, <laughs> that and crackers was a favorite of mine. Um, of course, we had the, the regular rations, but uh, uh, when we were able to uh, be close to uh, cooking, why we had meals, hmm. regular meals. What were nights like? What was nights? What was nights? They were. Uh, uh, my wife finally sent me a radio, hmm. and uh, <clears throat> at that time it was, it was a little radio, and we either wrote letters home. Or uh, we went to the officers' club, <laughs> or uh, uh, we just uh, hung out with our fellow officers. Did you make uh, good friends during that time? Yes, yes. Did had, you? Uh, I had uh, I had several officer friends that uh, I kept contact with, hmm. but uh, of course I've lost them all. Yeah. I see. And um, so from Leyte, you you went to Japan, the mainland. We went to Japan on a um, LSD, which is a, we loaded all our equipment on the LSD. And um, <clears throat> on the way up, it was so, the water was so rough that that thing go up, it flopped down, go up, it flopped down. Well, that caused the equipment, heavy equipment on there, our tractors and graders and all the heavy equipment um, got loose. Mm. And, uh, of course, the officers had to go out there to make sure that uh, uh, everything was tied back down. Mm. But the ride from, <laughs> from Leyte to Japan was uh, rough. <laughs> we were sick. But still, we had to tie down the equipment. <laughs> I see. Were mines a big problem in the harbor? Not for us, no. Okay. Mm -mm. No, we didn't experience any. What was your first day like in Japan? Uh, primarily getting acquainted in Tokugawa uh, and uh, making sure that um, my... Um, company got the equipment uh, unloaded and moved to Tokorozawa and uh, in that big old maintenance building that we had. Okay. And your time there was spent mostly on base there? Yes. Okay. Yes. How long were you in Japan? Uh, I spent about a year and a half. No. Two years, I don't remember. I have a vivid memory of um, deciding that one day we group of officers, four of us, decided we were going to go to uh, Mount Fuji. Hmm. Well, uh, we were not experienced enough in Japan to know that the roads don't go straight there. Hmm. So we took off. Uh, for the weekend and decided we was going to get there, but uh, since the roads didn't go there, we never did end up to get to Mount Fuji because <laughs> the roads just don't go that direction. They, they're they not, they weren't uh, laid out like they are in the States. Right. And uh, you may have a road this far, but then you got to go this way or uh, <clears throat> we just got to the uh, hardly to the base of the mountain. Hmm. Uh, that was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the countryside like? You know, it was uh, lots of vegetation. That, uh, was, uh, other than that and the fact the roads didn't go uh, like they do in the United States, <laughs> right. uh, I didn't see much different. Hmm. What were your thoughts of the Japanese culture? Uh, 
the general population were very friendly. Hmm. Uh, those that we uh, were working with and uh, uh, associated with were very friendly and very um, um, we'll say they of course they bow, bowed for everything. I was trying to think of the word how to describe that, but they were um, a culture that uh, you really enjoyed um, associating with. Hmm. Possibly humble? Or? Humble, hmm. yeah, humble. Okay. Uh, now I'm sure that the um, oh, military folks and the and the uh, those in charge, uh, they would have a different attitude. But I wasn't associated with them. Hmm. Did you ever uh, come across prisoners of war or any enemy soldiers? No. No? Okay. Mm. So, um, what was the food like in Japan? Well, we were able then to have a, a cook and uh, we were fed whatever they were able to furnish and be available. So you didn't try much of the local cuisine? No, well, no. Well, no, never did do that. <laughs> never did do that. Uh, I still have one of the uh, rations in there. Really, <laughs> sea rations? Yeah, sea oh. rations. Did you uh, did you keep the sword? Or the samurai sword? Did you keep it? I did, but then um, oh, what about uh, ten years ago? Uh, a Japanese student went to school learned somehow that I had one. Hmm. So uh, he called and wanted to know if he could see it. And I said, well, sure. So he came out, and I didn't know that the handle that could be taken apart. And he sat down in there and just took that thing apart, just as simple as complete. With a, there was that little peg in it. Hmm. He took it apart and looked at the uh, middle end of it, or the, or the handle, and he knew exactly uh, wh where it was made and uh, what company made it. Some of the history of the sword. Huh. So, um, I don't know, he offered to buy it, so I sold it to him. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are some of your favorite memories during your war time? Oh... Of course, the hardest memories was uh, being away from home, mm -hmm. um, being away from a new wife, um, uh, seeing the demolished areas of Mandela and, and what little I did in, in Leyte. I, I expect those were the the um, most vivid memories. Yeah. What about uh, favorite experiences, perhaps with other soldiers? Well, um, people are different, and uh, we had one officer that uh, associated very freely with uh, the ladies. Uh, but uh, most of the others were uh, less um, let's say uh, less uh, free let's <laughs> see um, and you were married during that time so that's a yes uh, yeah okay and um, did you have children during that time or no oh, okay no not until we came back. And uh, uh, then Sherlock was born in 49. Okay. So I stayed in the, I was offered the opportunity to uh, uh, sign up and uh, remain in, in the military. And I chose to uh, stay in the reserve. 
I made a mistake um, by not keeping my 10,000 of insurance. I, I only kept 5,000. Hmm. Well, I still still get the interest off of that 5,000. And uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that was a mistake. But by staying in the reserve and uh, going to camp every year for two weeks uh, allowed me to uh, retire uh, with 20 years of service. Hmm. And uh, that course has been most beneficial hmm. because it uh, uh, I, I'm able to get all of my drugs paid for. It paid for all of the medication from my wife, mm. which which was a tremendous amount. Mm. Um, so it was very beneficial to stay in the service uh, for the 20 years. Was there a fear of being recalled uh, during Korea? I was not recalled. Uh, another experience was that uh, by staying in the reserve and fulfilling my requirements for two weeks of training every uh, every year, I went to, went to Wisconsin to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, and then I went to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana for those times. Okay. And. Uh, it was just continual training. We built little bridges, we built little roads. We uh, sort of maintained our ability to uh, do, do those things. Well, I came here to Oklahoma State <clears throat> to go to college. No, 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 to go uh, for the job. And um, uh, I uh, had my Ph.D. by going to school at the same time I was in the reserve. Huh. Well, I got promoted to captain, and uh, <clears throat> then I was promoted to a major. Well, and I said that uh, I uh, earned my Ph.D. and that should count. And they said no. The military said no, that <clears throat> I did not go to a command and general staff school. Hmm. So, even though they published an order and uh, advanced my grade to major, after a few weeks they uh, took that back hmm. with the understanding that I did not, you know, even though I got a PhD. Uh, I didn't go to command and general staff school. Yeah. In order to have, be a major, you got to go to general <laughs> command and general staff school. I see. Yeah. It was a sad thing. You yeah. Know? So uh, during my reserve time, I, I got a little less money. That's what it amounted to. Hmm. So did you go back to school on the GI Bill? I did. At ninety dollars a month. Uh, with a married uh, wife and a child at uh, Manhattan, we lived on ninety dollars a month. Wow! Uh, in order to, when the child came, uh, she decided she would go back to work, so she worked at a little drugstore in Manhattan. Mm. Supplemented the um, ninety dollars. Well, when I had time, <clears throat> I managed a, uh, a picture show or theater in Manhattan. Hmm. And so after finishing school, I would walk down to the town and uh, I managed a theater at night. And after I closed off, closed up at night after the show was over, then I had to walk back uh, up to the campus, hmm. sometime midnight. 
what was it like going back to school um, after so many years? You had military service behind you, you were an older student, you were a veteran. What was it like uh, associating with the other kids who had not went to war? I, I, was, uh, I was interested in education. Uh, exactly what reason I, I, can, I can't say, but uh, even though I asked Dad that I want to go to school, that desire remained with me all that time. So even though I came back from the service with the schooling I had, I uh, was still eager to learn, eager to know more. I see. And so that carried with me through the master's degree and the PhD program. And uh, did you live on campus or veteran housing? I lived in, uh, we lived in a upstairs apartment of a lady that was uh, 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 of age, older age, and was sort of a needed support. Hmm. And so Alberta took care of her uh, part of the time hmm. that she was available. And you had children while you were in school? I had that, uh, had that one girl, Sherilyn. And uh, so when I finished my master's program, uh, I was hired to go to uh, uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. So the wife and I and the little girl um, put all our stuff in a trailer and pulled it out to West Virginia, Morgantown. Well, there wasn't any housing available. Uh, even though they were developing student housing, there was, still wasn't a place for us. Hmm. So we stayed with the uh, head of the department. He was an older gentleman, his wife was older. So we lived with them for, uh, I guess it was about 10 months, until we finally got a little place on, the, on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, <clears throat> Uh, I was able to um, teach the students that were coming home from service uh, sufficiently well that we took our, our group of team to Chicago and uh, this was a um, meets judging team and they <clears throat> They uh, judged beef, pork, and bacon, and hams, and all that sort of thing. Okay. As an international uh, meeting. And the first year, they, um, I think they got second. The second year I took them up there, they uh, won the international show. Hmm. Well, that uh, publicity allowed me then to leave West Virginia and go to Columbia, Missouri to work on a PhD. I see. And so then when I got the PhD at Columbia, Missouri, the folks hired me down here. At OSU? At OSU. What year was that? 1956. And been here ever since? Yep. Um, what are some of your favorite memories of teaching at OSU? Oh, uh, I was hired in as a 75% uh, research and 25% teaching. Hmm. They, when I came in 56, this was a state that was producing animals. They were producing wheat. They had peanuts and they had pecans and fruit, but there was no no manufacturing or no processing of those products in the state. Hmm. Everything was leaving the state. Uh, so when I came in, I uh, agitated for a uh, food science program. And <clears throat> that meant that they already had the BS degree program here in uh, 
animal science. But I had to develop then a uh, master's program. So I wrote a master's program, hmm. got it approved. I got graduate students. And then uh, when I got graduate students, then we had to have a PhD program. So I wrote the PhD program. Now, my whole philosophy was to develop a food science degree program. Hmm. And I, since I was in animal science, uh, that was beef, pork, and dairy, and so forth. Hmm. Well, I went to the uh, provost and, and said, well, uh, I need to have a PhD program. Okay, you you write up uh, uh, the, the the program to get it. And I said I want to get it now in meat science. And uh, the dean of the graduate school at that time says no, that was Boggs. Boggs says no, we can't do that because. If I, if you if you get if I let you get a degree in meat science, then peanuts is going to want one, and fruits going to want one, and and uh, soybeans is going to want one. Mm -hmm. So we've got to call it food science. Mm -hmm. So I developed this food science program, and then when the politicians got involved then they made it so that that food and agriculture building, instead of being a uh, department of food science, they made it as a state uh, facility to teach how to uh, manufacture these food items in the state, hmm. rather than a food science department, it became a food uh, development, state food development uh, facility. Hmm. So that's what that food and agriculture building does. Uh, even though graduate students are working there and, and undergraduates are working there, the, uh, the the charge is is not to not to um, have a food science program, but to process, teach you how to manufacture that product. Hmm. So they've they've done an excellent job hmm. of uh, <clears throat> helping anyone out in the state to make barbecue sauce, make wine. Uh, how to how to process uh, the peaches? Hmm. Uh, in other words, if you wanted to, if you want to be a um, mushroom, want to develop mushrooms, you can come in there and they, they'll be taught how to help them develop their their company. Hmm. So that's the difference. I see. What are some of your other roles in the community here at Stillwater? <laughs> Well, I uh, developed the the uh, Kiwanis Club. Uh, we we now have three Kiwanis Club in Stillwater, and that's a service group that uh, um, <clears throat> uh, helps children in the community. Our policy is that uh, develop one child at a time. So we work with the children a lot. What was your inspiration behind that? Uh, while at Manhattan, a Navy uh, dentist, I went to the Navy dentist and he filled my tooth. And uh, he asked me to join the Qantas Club in Manhattan. Okay. So I joined the Qantas Club in Manhattan. I carried that with me to Morgantown carried it with me to Stillwater, okay. and uh, I was uh, charged with becoming the lieutenant, lieutenant governor. Hmm. Uh, worked with the Phillips Petroleum Company governor, 
and I was lieutenant governor. Um, so we developed Qantas Club. Okay. The other thing was that um, I, when I finished college and came here and developed these programs at you know, Oklahoma State and then retired in 1986, I learned in 1986 that even though you've spent 30 years in OSU, when you retired, you were dropped off of the rolls. You, you didn't exist in Oklahoma. You were no longer uh, carried on. So at that time, the president was um, of the university was uh, out telling people how how great the university is and how good the students are and how great a staff you have and and uh, all that sort of stuff. Well, and then when I retired, then I was I decided that that didn't sound good to me. So I wrote a letter to the president and said, what makes a great university is how you treat the f retired faculty. Hmm. Well, that, that hit <laughs> a little bit. And uh, so he passed the letter to the provost, which was Jay Boggs. And uh, in a short period of time, maybe maybe three weeks or a month, and he got me on the phone and said, um, uh, "Are you uh, willing to be on the chair of the committee to develop the uh, see if the faculty wants to be organized? That is, the retired faculty mm. wants to be organized." And I said, "Sure." So he gave me. Uh, four people on the committee. One was an engineer, one was a math, and one was uh, extension, and one was a finance. And he says, you five people, um, see if the faculty want to, uh, the retired faculty want to be organized. So we set to work and the first meeting we had we had 150 show up, so I went back to him and said, "Yes, they want to. They want to be organized." So we, we've developed the uh, um, Meritai Association, mm. and if you've been over to the Alumni Center, uh, the picture of uh, we f we four uh, is pictured there in the Meritai room, which the Alumni Center has uh, donated one room with facilities to meet and eat uh, in the Alumni building. So it all came about as a result of uh, my letter to the president saying what makes a great university. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like uh, the benefits to your coming to Stillwater have really well, improved the community. Just one of those things that I had the privilege of doing. And, uh, so you've lived and seen several parts of the world. Um, what kept you in Stillwater? Well, because um, they had nothing uh, in the food processing area at the time and uh, so the fact that I was able to develop things um, encouraged me to stay here even though I was invited to go to Pennsylvania and I was invited to go to other places. I did go visit but came back and decided well, I don't want to move <laughs> and um, there was always something that was challenging me. I um, was developed my program in meat so that I knew meat, poultry, and seafood. Wrote a book. And uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I uh, was invited to be the scientific advisor for the International Association of Refrigerated Warehouses. Hmm. Now, if you're acquainted at all with with food, it has to come in and be stored in a refrigerated warehouse, hmm. like U.S. cold storage, uh, and they're they're now scattered worldwide. Um, I was invited to be their scientific advisor while here teaching and research. So for 27 years I was their meat, poultry, and seafood specialist. When they needed some question answered, they called on the phone or they wrote me and um, I continued to advise them relative to food. Whenever they had a cold storage company that had a loss, it was usually because they mistreated it. Mm -hmm. I was asked then to uh, uh, go see if that product was acceptable for human consumption. And of course, you're not acquainted, but they stored the food in 2,000 pound combos. Okay. And um, I would, uh, go and check that food out. If it wasn't suitable for human consumption, then they had to use it for dog food or, or animal food. We were talking about uh, what kept you in still water. Oh, well, while I was doing my jobs at the university, which was teaching graduate school and, and uh, developing the program, why, by being invited to work with the uh, refrigerated warehouses for 27 years, I was their uh, scientific advisor. And so whether, it didn't make any difference whether it was beans that came in from Mexico or meat that was uh, mishandled, I then would determine that and or worked mostly with the lawyers. Hmm. So the warehouse would get their lawyer to um, decide whether that was product was good or not. The lawyer got a hold of me as a scientific person hmm. and I would evaluate that food. Uh, if it was frozen, I'd have to drill holes in it. Uh, and sometimes I would have to bring it back to the laboratory and analyze it. Hmm. But in any case, then I would advise the lawyer, yes, this product's okay, or no, it needs to be disposed of. And so I did that for 27 years. It's a very important job. <laughs> and it was, it was fun because the pay I got was to take my wife and I uh, for four days, sometimes five, to the, the best places in the United States. Hmm. And I got to travel to uh, England with them uh, for four days. Whenever they would have their association meeting, hmm. why then that year uh, we would have a vacation hmm. with them. I didn't get paid, I just got the privilege of spending four to six days uh, in one of the nicest places in the United States. What are some of your favorite places in the world that you've been? Well, I think my most favorite place was when they took me to uh, Spain. Spain. Barcelona? Barcelona. Hmm. Uh, I got to visit um, uh, Isla Capri. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'd say Spain because of the ruins. Hmm. You know, I uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed England, but most memorable was Spain because of the ruins. Interesting. Yeah. And um, did your children go to OSU as well? All three of them went to OSU. Uh, the oldest one decided uh, that she wanted to go to 
graduate school in um, Austin, Austin, Texas. Hmm. So she finished her PhD down there. Okay. Uh, the other two finished their uh, BS degrees here, and uh, they didn't go further in school. They just finished their. She's the only one that went to. The oldest one went got a PhD. And do you have grandchildren as well? I have two daughters, granddaughters. Uh, both are married, hmm. but I have five great grandsons. Wow. <laughs> and uh, do you have family here in Oklahoma? At the present time, I have my oldest daughter in Tulsa. Okay. Uh, and the two granddaughters and their five children are in Oklahoma. Okay. In Tulsa area. So Oklahoma has become a new home for you then, huh? I'm an adopted Oklahoma. <laughs> they officially adopted me. So uh, what does Oklahoma mean to you? Well, it means that I've, I've given the state um, uh, 40 years of my life. And so rather than um, donate my money to K-State or West Virginia or Missouri, I've uh, dedicated my money to OSU. I see. I'm sure that it's uh, helping many undergraduates become successful I as well. I just received a letter yesterday indicating that the scholarship that I've given will be a hundred and fifty thousand dollar scholarship for the food science area. Wow, that's very uh, valuable. <laughs> um, what has contributed to your success, do you feel? My curiosity for knowledge, I think. And what are some of the greatest rewards of education? Uh, being accepted to uh, assist others uh, in the world uh, and through education and through uh, working with industry. And you've survived World War II and you were in the military for 20 years. Uh, so that would include Korea and up to 62, I would imagine. Um, so right at the end of Kennedy's terms, would you care to share your um, political insights to uh, while you experience some of the greatest struggles, ideological struggles, such as against fascism and communism was such an integral part of that history. Would you care to share some of your insights into that? I'm not. Uh, interested in politics other than I criticize it. what's <laughs> not right. <laughs> what are some of your criticisms that you wouldn't mind sharing? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, we, we're not using the policies or we're not developing and using the policies that uh, we should be using. For example, the war situation, uh, the uh, immigration situation, and why we can't fix these things. We don't have an energy policy. Why don't we do it? Uh, so when you analyze it, you find that the big, big oil, big energy companies are influencing our people in Washington. So all of the people up there, whether Republicans or Democrats, need to be removed yeah. and put in new people that has been there for anywhere from 20 to 40 years. They've been up there and all they're concerned with is developing their own political uh, philosophy. Absolutely. Rather than helping the, the public. And that's frustrating. 
Absolutely. The other thing that bothers me is that they're, they're demonstrating to the public that we should, we should work this, this group against this group. And you know, when you see them up there, instead of working together, they're telling the world that uh, you should fight each other. Mm. That bothers me. Absolutely. And uh, throughout your life, you've witnessed some of the greatest changes to American society. Um, you've experienced World War II. You grew up there during the Depression. What is the, the greatest change in American society that you've witnessed? The greatest change is the, the, uh, the Internet. Uh, I suppose we should call it some, some other term, uh, but it's the, uh, the computer, the uh, iPad and the iPhone and the, uh, the Intels and the, <laughs> and the Silicon Valley uh, influence, for example, Absolutely. that's had on the world. And uh, I guess we call it social change, which uh, has not been for the totally for the benefit, the best. Hmm. Uh, and we're having trouble learning how to utilize that social change. Hmm. Uh, when I watch those grandchildren sit there and play like this. They're learning something on that little thing with the ears plugs in, but they're not learning uh, to be socially experienced, and they're they're not learning to read, mm. and in many cases they're not learning to write. So I see this. This young generation that is uh, uh, so involved with these uh, uh, these tools that they can sit and hear and listen that education is uh, changing rapidly, and while the student up on the campus, you can take a course in in Boston, or you can take a course at uh, any one of the high-priced, uh, or no, not necessarily high-priced, but highly thought of uh, schools, and maybe it's going to be credited, but uh, it may not be credited. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can take a course online uh, from any school in the world, so to speak. But when you get it back here, is it going to be credited or not? Hmm. And uh, I see that you can't teach football online. Uh, you can teach uh, uh, this course online, but there are some of the courses that you can't. You know, for example, chemistry. I don't think you can teach chemistry lab online. Hmm. Uh, but there are other things that you could teach online. Hmm. Well, you, you mentioned social change, and I like to ask this question particularly to veterans. What are both the greatest and the worst aspects of humanity that you've experienced in your 94 years? Well, I don't know that it's it's the greatest, but I I see that uh, this this preacher on TV has charisma, has knowledge, has has a, the ability to uh, somewhat entertain you. Uh, I see that uh, there's courses that can be taught online so that that teacher is is so 
uh, involved and able to entertain you with a course. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a course in library, but it's a course. Mm -hmm. So it concerns me as to what kind of a teacher must we have to interest that student that can play all this stuff on his um, his tool. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that there's a, a drop in people going to church. What are they doing? Uh, everything else that's available. I, I can see that uh, maybe there's going to be a, a drop, even though I see an increase in college students. Uh, are they going to take courses online or are they going to take courses uh, where they have an interaction with the, both the teacher and the other students? I, see. Uh, I don't know if that's what you were <laughs> hitting at, but that's what bothers me I see. as I sit on the outside. Well, I think the education is such an integral part of social change, so I think that that's is. A, a very good yeah. insight. Um, before we end, is there any th anything throughout the interview that you wanted to discuss from your life experiences that I haven't asked? Not that I can really think of. I, I, um, have, I just have an interest in knowledge and I continue to, um, try to follow the news online. I, I am an emeritus of the university and I follow all of the things that I can there. Hmm. I'm emeritus of this International Associated of Refrigerator Warehouses, which they call me an emeriti, mm -hmm. so that I get all of the food industry magazines free from them. Hmm. And uh, that's a volume of, bunch of, of magazines. Absolutely. So, I, I'm privileged to keep up by uh, publications. I'm interested, I'm able to keep up by uh, communications with the university, uh, the Emeriti Association. Uh, I helped develop this uh, OLLI program, which we have now. Oh, yeah. You're acquainted with. I've heard of it. Yeah, well, it's a, actually a school for people that are retired. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I think that I've been privileged to have those things to continue my knowledge, yet I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever history is written about you, what would you like it to say? that I influenced some uh, youth uh, during my time. I was um, had an opportunity this week to visit the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. And lo and behold, the uh, director of the food service group for the foundation came up and he shook my hand and he says, uh, I went, I was one of your students. Hmm. And he says, I have your book. And he says, I kept your book, the only one that I have kept out of going to school. Wow. <laughs> that was just, that was just, uh, what was it? Today's Thursday, it was Tuesday, Tuesday. Hmm. I was down there. Another example that um, a chap from Florida called me. He says, I'm teaching uh, a new course down here. I need a copy of your book. So I arranged to send him a copy of my book. But he went ahead to tell me, he says, I have a group that I'm teaching how to uh, use ice and make a, make these uh, skeletons or make these... Uh, cultured things for 
out of ice ice sculptures. Oh, ice sculptures. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he was he was not only teaching the other things, but he was teaching them ice sculpture. You know, just just to have uh, uh, thought that I've helped somebody through my life. I work very care very closely with the one notorium down here. Are oh, you yeah. acquainted? Um, the writing center actually is associated with that. I haven't been, but um, well, you ought to go. Yeah, I've uh, I do I do uh, woodcraft a lot of woodcraft. Hmm. So they know that, and I've built tables for them. I built chairs for them. I benches for them. Hmm. Um, so I I have the. I have a good feeling that I've uh, helped a lot of youth yeah, in Stillwater. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Henriksen, I would like to thank you for not only for your service to your country, but for your service to OSU, your community. And as an oral historian, I would like to thank you for sharing that experience. Well, there is one other thing. Right. I, I was invited to um, uh, Go to uh, the uh, honor honor um, group. Uh, World War Two people that are still living uh, was on June the fourth. I was uh, privileged to go to Washington D.C. Wow! With the honor society honor group. And there were 86 of us that uh, went. Uh, 14 of the 86 was um, uh, Vietnam. The rest were all World War II. And they uh, got us up at uh, 3.30 in the morning and uh, put us on the airplane. We flew to Baltimore. The police escorted us everywhere we wanted to go. They showed us all of the monuments in Washington, D.C. World War II, the Vietnam, the Korean, uh, the Air Force, so on. And uh, by being escorted by the police, we didn't stop at stop signs. In other words, we didn't lose time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we came back into Oklahoma City, 10 o'clock at night, and there was a, anywhere from two to 400 people, men, women, and children, with a band playing for, uh, as we came in. The kids were handing out flags, and it was just a wonderful treat wow. to come back in 10 o'clock at night with all these people brought tears to your eyes. Absolutely. But um, one day, you think that you can fly to Washington, D.C., see the monuments, come on back in one day. It's, uh, it, it was a real honor Absolutely. to do that. And that was a, a D-Day ceremony, June 6th? June the 4th. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. What does American society need to to learn from what has been called the greatest generation, the generation of World War II veterans? And what does it need to apply to today's veterans, the, the men coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan? How does society need to make that transition better for them? Well... Find jobs for them. Um, develop policies that will permit them to come back and be medically treated uh, and uh, offered the job opportunities so that they can uh, integrate back into the society. I'm proud to say that OSU 
is um, uh, helping veterans come back and uh, if they want to uh, open a business or uh, develop a trade or a company, they're helping teach them how to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of thing I think that would be very helpful. Um, what helped you reintegrate? The, my interest in knowledge, mm -hmm. wanting to go back to college, wanted to um, learn more. Absolutely. I grew up in a family of nine and had so few privileges that uh, I guess I wanted to uh, overcome those. Mm -hmm. I was very naive. I was uh, uh, I, I, I marvel at the young people today, what opportunities they have. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to play the piano. I don't know how to play the piano. Uh, yet I see that the young generation have that privilege to not only get an education but to learn music on the side and do things in addition mm -hmm. to just becoming educated. But yet I'm afraid some of them are not becoming educated. Mm. <laughs> uh, the great paradox of American education today, right? Yeah. And I, 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 I'm so disappointed that uh, uh, we have so many children that, that are not cared for by the parent. Mm. They, uh, the, the best job in the world for a lady is uh, to care for her children and the husband hmm. and uh, I don't see we're doing that. How did you achieve so much for the OSU community and have a strong family life as well and raise three children? Balance the, the need I saw a need and tried to fill it. Um, this was true with the uh, Alumni Association, uh, with the Meritai Association. Mm -hmm. I saw a need and I tried to fill it. I saw a need in the Qantas Club and uh, helped build two clubs. So I, th I think it's a matter there of of uh, seeing a need and then trying to help. Uh, I see a need with young people that, uh, like the Wonderatorium, they are really doing a, a nice job for these young people, children. And uh, I'm willing to help them do that. Absolutely. So there's a need there's a need for caring for these um, uh, children that can't get along with their parents. There's a need for those uh, young people that uh, uh, some reason or other get into trouble. And I, I help where I can with those kind of situations. I've served, I, I served uh, six years on the uh, Medical Center Foundation Board. I served six years uh, on the um, youth, I forgot the, what they call it, youth um, for kids that get in trouble and the police take them out there to the home and they tried to rehabil rehabilitate him. Uh, kids run away from home, and uh, so I, I've helped, <clears throat> tried to help there. Uh, I don't know if that's what you ask, but... <laughs> uh, well, it, it seems to me that you've, you've contributed back a lot 
uh, more so than many, in fact. Um, and I'll, I'll ask one more question. Um, what advice would you give to, besides the technology and uh, other things that we've discussed, what advice would you give to a, to a graduate of OSU, to someone who's graduating high school or college? Um, what advice could you give to... Look for a need and, and, and fill, fill it, it mm -hmm. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, but get it. Get a good education and be able to read and be able to write and uh, be able to communicate. If you don't have those three things, you can't go very far. Absolutely. Right? All right. Well, I'd like to thank you again. Uh, it's my privilege. <laughs> uh, I'm sure the privilege yeah. was all mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. You bet.